Right, so this week we're going to look at masquerades, which are kind of a mainstay of urban fantasy. Um, the idea is that basically the mundane population has no idea what the fantasy conceits are, which usually are magic or special monsters, uh, werewolves, vampires, that kind of thing. Those all fall under the uh, auspices of uh, urban fantasy as fantasy conceits. And um, the masquerade usually uh, involves the uh, regular populace not knowing about it. It's taken from Vampire the Masquerade, a role-playing game from the 90s, uh, which still exists today, and I'm still waiting for the uh, Bloodlines 2, but that's another story for another day. Um, the idea was that part of the vampires, all the vampires uh, abided by a code, which was that you know, no one ever finds out that vampires and werewolves and all that exists. If you do, uh, we will kill you because that jeopardizes all of our lives if we do that. Um, there was another group, Sabat, I think, that didn't do that, but... Again, another story for another day. Uh, a lot of the mainstays uh, use the masquerade. Uh, Harry Potter, Buffy, Dresden is sort of ish, even though he is, you know, in the phone book kind of thing. But uh, you know, the general population doesn't quite know about it. This is in opposition to like Anita Blake or True Blood, where uh, the fact that vampires and werewolves and necromancers exist is all out in the open. In fact, that's kind of True Blood's uh, conceit was that oh, they can come forward and uh, drink. You know, real blood, or not real blood, fake blood, so they don't have to drink real blood. So the idea was there was the masquerade had been pulled away and all these creatures were revealed to the general populace. Um, we kind of use masquerades because it's really good for drama um, within the stories itself. It keeps the world constant uh, so that, you know, we don't have to do a whole bunch of changes. All these massive things like werewolves and magic doesn't change society at large, so we can hold all of that in a constant and um, and then examine the fantasy conceits more. So it's kind of like why we use uh, analog cultures of like, okay, this is all the stuff that you know, and so we can only look at the, uh, the, the new fantasy conceits, new things that we've introduced into it. Um, let's see, uh, it's kind of like superheroes and their secret identities, um, and again, it creates more drama of, you know, yeah, I'm Spider-Man, I have all these really cool powers, but no one can know who I am because it'll jeopardize my family. So that means that, you know, it adds a lot more drama to, like, the having to go find his mask, trying to keep everyone from finding out who he is. And the same is true with the masquerade. It can add a lot more drama when uh, Buffy has to hide all of her powers from her mother because, you know, uh, she doesn't want to endanger her and keep all the other kids in high school safe by not knowing who she is. Um, Superheroes are kind of a non-masquerade in and of itself and that the superhero powers are usually out in the open. Superman flies around, but he has a secret identity. Uh, so it's kind of a masquerade within a non-masquerade, which is just kind of cool. Uh, we also, uh, part of the reason we use masquerades is that it introduces a cultural component in uh, the type of the uh, six fantasy conceits. Uh, culture is usually at the bottom, uh, but these work really well for urban fantasies where uh, our culture is kind of divergent and then um, you know, everything is exactly the same, except for these uh, magicians or vampires or whatever. So we spend a lot of the story examining the culture uh, that grows up around having this magic in a modern time. Uh, it's a new society and, uh, you know, exploring all those concepts uh, and how that changes this very small niche uh, society. So with that in mind, we are going to do a urban, uh, urban fantasy environment, uh, modern probably, and uh, then I'm gonna do one with a masquerade and then without a masquerade very briefly, probably, let's see if it works because I have no idea, to show how much more difficult adding these conceits to the whole world would be. So, ah, did not plan this well. Ta da, let's see what we got. If I get two moons, I'm putting it back because uh, that would be too uh, difficult for it. Cannibalism. Oh, why do I always get that one from Dave? I hope he got his book. I don't know if I ever checked with him. Yeah. Invisibility cloak uh, from uh, that one guy. <laughs> and dystopia. I oh, we can't do a dystopia if we're gonna do a masquerade. Mecca. Mm. Giants. Okay, that'll be interesting. So invisibility cloak, giants, and cannibalism. Mm. All right, fine, we'll see. All right, uh, give me a few minutes. I will try to figure out uh, some fantasy conceits out of that with some uh, building up, and then I will build out a little bit later and with some uh, a masquerade and how that's gonna work. See you in a bit.
So we're, oh, about 15 minutes in now, and I think I've done the bottom up uh, slash uh, building up phase of this. Uh, my three conceits were giants, invisibility cloaks, and it was supposed to be cannibalism, but I threw that one out because it just wasn't going to work uh, very easily, and I grabbed witches instead. So um, witches, invisibility cloaks, and giants, that immediately starts to make sense uh, in that if you have giants in this urban fantasy, uh, they're going to need to stay hidden, invisibility cloaks, and who can build invisibility cloaks better than witches? So that's uh, trying, you know, stringing them all together and streamlining them and making them so they make sense. I added a culture on there because again, that's what uh, the urban fantasy is, is really about examining the magical culture and the fantasy conceits. Um, real quick with that one, I uh, had to have some questions like why is there masquerade? Um, you know, obviously who makes the cloak? That's the streamlining. Uh, decided to do a cost system that will be based on that. Uh, if you remember from our magic systems video earlier, um, cost is used a lot for building things like potions and kind of like a crafting system. So, you know, we're going to need material and time to build it, which means the witches are going to need servants to go get their things. So that's, you know, so it brings the giants in. So the idea is of this world is that giants are only probably going to be about 10 feet tall or so. And um, so, you know, small giants, uh, the size of a room, so they can still get around in the city because you just don't want 30 you know, 30 uh, foot giants running around. Um, so we're gonna make them 10 feet. Uh, they work for the witches. They acquire the materials the witches need for their potions. Um, and in exchange, the witches give them invisibility, visibility cloaks to, um, to do that. So I also was thinking about uh, antecedents and this kind of thing. Uh, there's two specifically. Uh, if there's giants existing and they um, are going to need uh, to find magical equipment for the um, for the witches, which sounds like it's going to be the basis of most of the story, um, then uh, we're going to need other things. Other magical creatures are going to exist in this world. Uh, so we already have one biolog biology biologic conceit, and I'm actually going to try to make that metaphysical in that I'm going to bring in the fae. Uh, spirits, trolls, which is what the giants are kind of kind of be like, you know, dwarves, elves, that kind of thing. Um, so there's going to be a portal world with fairyland, um, and most of the magical creatures have gone to the fairyland and left the earth as we know it, the urban fantasy, uh, with its masquerade in place. Um, so for some reason, and that's another one of the antecedents up there, uh, the giants, this one clan of giants has stayed behind and they serve the witches and the witches that have remained on Earth. Um, so the story is going to be, if I come up with the story, because of course I'm going to come up with the story because, you know, I've got 30 minutes before I have to go pick up the kid. Um, the story is going to be about, you know, one of the, uh, one of the giants having to go you know, work for his witch uh, or her witch or whoever, and I haven't decided that part yet. Um, the, uh, you know, so the giant has to navigate the city, all the magical, uh, some of the, you know, the fairies that have decided to have been exiled or whatever and are living in this world, having to stay hidden from the humans. Uh, this giant with a cloak having to stay hidden from the humans as well as being sent on the tasks to uh, get things for their witch. Um, another idea of kind of working with, uh, we're going to develop it just a little bit further, uh, is there might be giant fight clubs to uh, gather things or betting between the witches because then the giants, you know, have a hard life because they have to remain hidden and uh, so they're dependent on the magic cloak, which means they're dependent on the witches. So that's going to add a little new uh, idea for the story and uh, then we're going to see what would happen to this world if uh, there was no uh, masquerade. So stay tuned, we'll be back in a little bit. So we're 40 minutes in, and I think we've got a pretty fun one. Uh, again, this world is all based on giants, invisibility cloaks, and um, uh, witches. And uh, we use the antecedents to realize that there should also be fae in this world, because if we have giants, then there must be other creatures as well. Not that there must be, but you know, it makes more sense and it helps with the story. So we're going to use uh, the fae exist. We have smaller giants that are only about 10 feet tall. And um, for our proto story of what I would do with this world um, is, you know, we've got a, uh, that the giants work for the witches, uh, these giants, um, 
all the, the magical creatures, most of the mag magical creatures have retreated to Fairyland. I can't think of a good name for that. I'm also really tired. Uh, the reason that we had uh, two weeks of hiatus was because uh, the kid got sick, and then the wife got sick, and then I got sick, so that was two weeks of no sleeping, and uh, <clears throat> you could still hear it a little bit. Anywho, um, so brain is still not working at 100%, uh, so please forgive me not using words that are big. Anyways, um, so this world, uh, we have, um, you know, it's basically two worlds, one with fairyland and then the real world, uh, that is our urban fantasy uh, where witches and giants exist. Uh, the giants are exiled from um, fairyland, which is basically cut off. There are portals, but they're very few and far between. Some creatures slip through, but most of the ones that exist in the real world are exiled for whatever reason. Um, uh, the portal is closely guarded, uh, but some can slip through on occasion. Uh, our story is going to uh, uh, revolve around a giant, let's say a giant S, because, um, you know, how, many, how often do you see female giants uh, other than what's her name in Harry Potter for like 15 minutes, maybe. Anyways, um, so, and uh, because um, this is about giants who have to use invisibility cloaks, uh, you know, we're going to have her wish that she could have recognition because you always need a good starting point and a kind of a character flaw to grow out of. Uh, she really wishes she um, uh, could be seen instead of having to skulk everywhere in her invisibility cloak or it was pretty like some of the Fae because, you know, She's this 10 foot tall giant. Um, we're also gonna have a Puck-esque character, and I mean Puck in kind of the Neil Gaiman slash uh, Gargoyles, uh, if you ever watched that 90s cartoon, I've been re-watching that one again, and that kind of Puck, you know, uh, the Shakespearean, dangerous, um, you can't really trust him. Um, and this character is going to torment our main character, uh, who I didn't th ever think of a name for, but our giantess. And, um, and this Puck character is going to have powers, uh, can do magic, while meanwhile the giant is just physically strong, and, but having to hide and you know, move about the city with an invisibility cloak that the uh, witches can take away at any time. Uh, her witch is you know, cruel, as all witches are, because in this world that's what it's going to be. Uh, it's not that they're cruel, it's just that you know, the, the giants really need the witches, and the witches don't need the giants so much, so they send the giants to go collect all the things that they need. Uh, the witches are going to make magical objects, that's the main form of their power here, and uh, because it's a cost system that means a lot of time and materials go into it, so we have a good use for the uh, giants themselves. Um, and uh, I haven't figured out what it is, but you know, the story is going to revolve around a, a big a big get of go steal me something, you know, another that's really important, the giantess has to do it. Meanwhile, the Puck character uh, finds out that the uh, giant is doing this, giantess is doing this, and is just tormenting her, getting in her way, making it harder and harder. Um, and you know, we raise the question of why does Puck still have powers? You know, the giants don't really have their powers in, in this world. And um, so why is Puck here? Is Puck exiled? Anyways, at the midpoint, because of Puck, uh, they upset other witches or something like that, uh, which causes her to lose her cloak entirely. And Puck, for whatever reason, loses her his her powers. Um, that's because it's midpoint. Midpoint was a twist where he uh, up the stakes significantly. So now we have you know the character who had this cloak to depend upon is now suddenly thrust into the open. Uh, is suddenly getting the recognition she doesn't need because if she gets caught, she will be killed. Um, they get more and more desperate, so it's, uh, this is where we bring in the culture of the witches themselves. Uh, let's say some of the witches use their giants and gamble on a giant fight club. And um, so giantess is very desperate, so is Puck, because now you know, we have uh, the opposite you know, enemies, not to lovers, but enemies to friends kind of thing. Uh, the two of them are having to work together so Puck can get their powers back. Um, so Giantess has to be in Fight Club. Uh, you know, since she's getting the recognition she never wanted, as everyone's seen her in the fight. Uh, but it doesn't quite work out because that would be too easy, and this is the bad guys close in and that kind of thing. Um, so even though they fail at the Fight Club, they do find uh, the secret to where the portal is. So the finale. Is going to be them going into Fairyland as a giant who, if she's caught in Fairyland, will be executed immediately. Uh, then we can dig into Puck's past of why Puck was in uh, Earth to begin with and is hunted, as also hunted in Fairyland. Um, you know, 
as they get whatever object it is and grow between them and become good friends, uh, they finally, the finale is they expose the witch and, um, but let's really twist this around and let's do it as an I am Iron Man kind of moment from Marvel where um, the giantess comes through, exposes the witches to national TV recognition. It is all over the news. Giants exists. Uh, magic exists, and so she does finally get the thing that she wanted all along, which is recognition. She and Puck are friends now. Puck hopefully has their powers back. That would be where I would end the first story. So, I said I was also going to try to make a non-masquerade. Um, and I could do that where now we have a you know, urban fantasy where giants have existed for a long time, witches are in there. We could fit them into analog cultures and jobs and that kind of thing, but, you know, uh, that would really, really affect technology and culture on earth and that kind of thing, which is why most people keep all that constant and then do the urban fantasy with the masquerade. So if we non-masqueraded it, it would really, really change earth kind of like uh, the craft sequence does with all their big magic conceits, yet it's still kind of here. Uh, so it's kind of divergent, though really weird. Um, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna pick up right from the end of that where the giantess comes across and is like, hey, I'm a giant, crud, magic exists, you know, Boom, the sequel in True Blood's kind of sense would uh, deal with that. And uh, now that the world knows that monsters and magic exist, uh, we're still gonna say that the fairies have decided to stay in fairyland, but now Earth is opening uh, diplomatic ties with fairyland and finding out, you know, um, are there immigrants from there that want to come across? How do we deal with status? You know, who brings across, who can come across, who can't, and what do we do with the giants and fairies that already exist here? Uh, this is kind of cool and we can do like the American Dreamers uh, where we can do an analog with that of, you know, well, all these creatures are here illegally and if they come forward, they get status, but do they? And should they be sent home? You know, so we have two, um, you know, factions with some people like get, ri get rid of all giants, you know, send them back home. And others are like, oh my God, no, they've lived here forever. Like they don't even know what it's like back in fairyland. Um, so now the giants are suddenly celebrities, so specifically the giants is, uh, from our first story. Uh, and you can also have celebrities coming forward to the, some of the further causes of let's support her, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, the government is pissed off that there's these human witches that have flown under the radar all this time and are trying to work with them. Uh, so this is changing our you know, world and our culture kind of thing. And let's say that they're actually uh, snatching up witches that are refusing to work with them and they're suddenly disappearing. So we could have a whole sequel based around this kind of new world, this new non-masquerade uh, giants and no longer needs the invisibility cloak and witches and fae. And, um, and it starts off with the cruel witch from the first story or a different witch, from, let's say from the Fight Club, showing up at the giantess's door who is now a celebrity and saying, please hide me from the government. I, you know, uh, I know that we've treated you badly before, but we need you now. And so we've kind of reversed everything where uh, you had your giantess and her invisibility cloak at the beginning under the cruel, you know, master, you know, a, a cruel, you know, a slave to a cruel witch. At this point, we've reversed everything where she's, the giantess is a celebrity and is helping defend and hide a witch uh, from the American government or whatever government. So anyways, that could be a really kind of uh, fun sequel to another story that, so, Anyways, like I always say, world creates story, which creates plot, which creates the world, and they all interact together uh, in the creative process, which uh, you've just witnessed a little bit of. Um, and it's using masquerades and uh, how it affects urban fantasy. So I hope you can use them to build some uh, better worlds.